Hi guys, welcome back to episode 14 of Medicine PYQ topic series and the topic I have chosen is Diabetic Ketoacidosis DKA and this is a very important topic from exam point of view and also examiner's favorite topic. So uh, let's get started. So let us first quickly see the PYQs which have come in NEET 2022 and 2020 and then we'll go through the topic in a crisp manner and we'll come back to the questions. So generally the questions which come in Diabetic Ketoacidosis are long questions like clinical stem questions where they give you the uh, clues and they can ask you anything regarding the management or the diagnosis or basic acid based disorder or any clinical features. So let us first see what the question came. Uh, so the first question was a 12 year old child who is known to have type 1 diabetes mellitus with confusion and drowsiness. Her mother says that she seems to be breathing very fast. On examination mucous membranes are dry and blood pressure is low that is 70 by 50 millimeter mercury. Random blood glucose is 415 milligram per deciliter and urine ketones 4 plus. What is the next best step in management? So options goes like 2 to 3 liters of normal saline over 1 to 3 hours, insulin infusion at 0.1 unit per kg per hour, arterial blood gas, insulin bolus of 0.1 unit per kg given IV. This was the first question which came. Then the second question, a patient with diabetes mellitus for the past 5 years presents with vomiting and abdominal pain. She is non-compliant with medication and appears dehydrated. Investigations revealed a blood sugar of 500 mg per deciliter and a presence of ketone bodies. What is the next best step in management? Again, they have given you the almost the diagnosis and uh, the clinical clues and they have asked you the next best step in management and the options were IV fluids with long acting insulin, IV fluids option C IV insulin and option D IV fluids with regular insulin. So let us quickly go through a topic and then we'll come back to this question and try to answer them one by one. So diabetic ketoacidosis, it is one of the very common acute complication of diabetes mellitus. It always has a precipitating event which could be infection, inadequate insulin, pregnancy, infarction, any intoxication like cocaine, etc. Most common cause of death in DKA, particularly in children is cerebral edema. Coming to pathophysiology, uh, so this is very simple. Uh, here, two main things are happening. One is insulin deficit and the other thing is increase in counter-regulatory hormones like the glucagon, uh, cortisol, etc. And there is always a precipitating factor which we just discussed uh, leading to this. Ultimately, there is a disruption in the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins and fats uh, which is leading to uh, glycogenolysis, proteolysis and decreased glucose uptake in muscles. In fat adipose tissues, there is more lipolysis, there is more breakdown of fats uh, leading to increased free fatty acids and in the liver there is more glycogenolysis, more gluconeogenesis, there is more glucose formation and there is more ketogenesis. Ultimately all of this is leading to two main entities, one is hyperglycemia and one is ketoacidosis. They are both the main pathogenesis behind diabetic ketoacidosis. Coming to the clinical features, so because of this patient presents with uncontrolled nausea, vomiting, acute abdominal pain. Uh, there is confusion, uh, patient have uh, an acidotic breathing, that is Kussmaul's breathing, it is a disproportionate dyspnea, then patient is very thirsty, they have a sweet smelling uh, breath which is also called as fruity order of breath and uh, they have a very high blood sugar, they are very lethargic, sleepy, there is increased heart rate, respiratory rate and there is generally fall in blood pressure or postural hypertension and patient also complains of blurred vision and needing to pee more often and uh, blood glucose levels are generally high and ketones are positive. In investigations, the ABG analysis is very important. It is always important to obtain a baseline pH and the electrolyte level so that we can uh, manage accordingly and then uh, go for other tests like urine for ketones uh, performed by the Rotheras method. Then uh, certain other tests like blood for CBC, uh, electrolyte levels and serum calcium, serum phosphate and others. Among the laboratory features, the important findings are the hyperglycemia definitely, there is more than 300 mg per deciliter. Acidosis is a prime feature, pH less than 7.3. Then bicarbonate and total PCO2 both goes down because there is a metabolic acidosis here. We will be discussing in more detail about the various types of acid based disorders in one of my videos which is coming soon. So stay tuned. Uh, but coming back to the topic, the other features like there is an elevated anion gap, then serum and urine both are positive for ketones, uh, there is a mild renal dysfunction and potassium levels are generally high, it could be normal also and um, sodium levels are generally low. So these are certain uh, important investigations which needs to be done in a patient who presents to the emergency with diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, these are certain findings which could be pet important questions in the MCQs. 
coming to the treatment part so there are mainly three main things which should be looked after one is the iv fluid one is the potassium and is the insulin so firstly uh, iv fluids so in iv fluids we generally start with uh, 1 to 1.5 liters of normal saline over first hour and we determine the hydration status if it is a severe hypovolemia that is patient is in shock or it's mild to moderate hypovolemia once the patient come back to the euvolemic state we calculate the corrected serum sodium and if it is more than 135.45 percent nacl is used depending on the clinical status and if it is less than 135 same ns is continued again depending on the clinical status once the glucose is less than 200 uh, milligram per deciliter the fluid is changed to dextrose 5 percent and the target glucose is 150 to 200 milligram per dl uh, coming to the insulin part so regular insulin use uh, this is an important point to note a uh, regular insulin iv bolus can be used then infusion can be given or a regular insulin iv infusion can be used without a bolus and the dose is 0.1 unit per kg and uh, for infusion 0.1 unit per kg per hour if the blood glucose does not fall by at least 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter or 10 percent first hour uh, we double the insulin infusion rate and uh, we increase the infusion rate by one unit per hour and when the glucose level comes down below 200 milligram per deciliter the insulin infusion is adjusted and also uh, at five percent dextrose is added to the iv fluids and the main target level of glucose is to keep it between 150 to 200 and criteria for resolution of diabetic ketoacidosis is the glucose should come down below 200 milligram per dl and two of the following should happen either serum bicarbonate should increase uh, pH should increase and anion gap should fall. Once this is achieved, uh, we can consider switching uh, IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin. And this is mainly done when patient can take orally. Coming to the potassium part, so this is a very important ion because uh, insulin has a very important role in uh, regulation of potassium. So if the potassium level is less than 3.3 millimole per liter, we do not start insulin until the potassium is corrected. We generally give 20 to 40 milli equivalent KCL per hour. If the potassium level is somewhere between 3.3 to 5.2, we generally give 30 to 40 milli equivalent KCL in each liter of IV fluid. And if it is more than 5.2, we do not consider giving potassium. The target serum potassium is 4 to 5 millimole per liter. Now, the take home points are uh, IV fluids, uh, how much it should be given, why the sodium levels are important, what is the target glucose in insulin. The point to be noted here is the regular insulin is considered and not the long acting insulin and also the root of the insulin is always IV and not subcutaneous. Uh, subcutaneous all, only started when the patient can take orally. And also the criteria for resolution of diabetic ketosis is important here and the potassium part which is important. The bicarbonate is not generally considered given. Uh, we only give bicarbonate when it is uh, very severe acidosis that is less than 6.9 uh, otherwise it is not much beneficial. Lastly a comparison between a diabetic ketoacidosis and HHS that is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state uh, because HHS is a very similar condition to diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, comparing is very important because uh, sometimes they may give you clinical features and you might get confused and they might ask you the diagnosis. So you should just have a brief idea regarding the comparison. So generally diabetic ketoacidosis is mainly seen in type 1 diabetes and HHS is seen in type 2 diabetes. Uh, patients generally present with abdominal pain, fruity order of breath, small breathing in decay whereas in HHS it is altered sensorium coma and it's more commonly seen in very elderly patient. Then in DKA, the glucose levels are somewhere between 250 to 600, whereas in HHS, it's as high as 600 to 1200. Sodium levels are low in DKA, 120 to 125, whereas in HHS is almost normal. And potassium levels in DKA are normal to high, whereas in HHS, it's normal. Osmolality is a very important differentiating factor. In DKA, it's somewhere between 300 to 320, whereas in HHS, it is increased 330 to 380, as the name suggests, hyperosmolar. Also, plasma ketones are definitely positive in DKA, but in HHS, it may be present, it may be absent. So, serum bicarbonate is definitely low in DKA, less than 50 milli equivalent per liter, but in HHS, it could be normal to slightly low. Uh, arterial pH is again an important differentiating factor. In DKA, it is reduced 6.8 to 7.3, whereas in HHS, it is more than 7.3. Arterial PCO2 also falls down in DKA, whereas in HHS, it's normal. Uh, lastly, anion gap is very high in DKA. And in HHS, it is normal to slight high. So this is a small comparison with DK and HHS. Now let us go back to the question. So this was a clinical question which came 
and in both the question they have already given you the clues and the clinical clues and everything that is pointing towards the diagnosis of ketoacidosis versus and both the time they have asked you the next best step in management so first question the a 12 year old child who is a known diabetes with confusion and drowsiness so they have given the clinical features here and the mother is saying that patient is having a, a fast breathing that is acidotic breathing and a patient is dehydrated and bp is low and blood sugar is high and urine ketones is 4 plus so it's clear cut case of dka and they have asked you what is the next best step in management and the options are 2 to 3 liters of normal saline over 1 to 3 hours insulin infusion at 0.1 unit per kg per hour uh, arterial blood gas that is abg and insulin bolus of 0.1 unit per kg given iv so if you remember the management part we just discussed these are all steps of management which is important but they have asked you the next best step in management from the question it seems the patient has just come to the emergency with this clinical features and the next best step is to obtain an abg when the patient first come to the emergency to have a baseline ph in the electrolyte levels so that the management can be decided as per that uh, so the best answer here is abg then we go for the iv fluids and the insulin part but always the first thing we do is obtain an abg so the answer here is arterial blood gas Coming to the second question, so uh, here the patient is having diabetes for past 5 years, presenting with clinical features of vomiting and abdominal pain uh, and she is also not having her medication regularly and appearing dehydrated and a blood sugar is of 500 mg per dl and presence of ketone bodies. So again they have given you the diagnosis of DKA and they have asked you the next best step in management. Here the options are slightly different, one is IV fluids with long acting insulin, one is IV fluids only. Uh, option C is IV insulin and option D is IV fluids with regular insulin. So the option A IV fluids with long acting insulin, we generally don't use long acting insulin in emergency situation. We generally give long acting insulin once the patient starts eating. Uh, only IV fluids will not help because uh, it will just replace the fluid but it will not control the glucose part and the other things. Only IV insulin cannot be given because the patient is grossly dehydrated. So the best answer here is IV fluids with regular insulin we start both of them together only reason to consider giving insulin little late is if the potassium levels are low otherwise iv fluids with regular insulin is the best option here we should be started as soon as possible once the abg is obtained uh, i hope guys this video was very useful and this is a very important topic you cannot miss this topic and i hope i could make it simple i would be discussing the acid based disorders in a different video which is very important where also we will be talking little bit about diabetic ketoacidosis and different types of acid based disorders so stay tuned till then keep studying keep revising keep solving as many mcqs as you can and i'll see you in the next one cheers